Welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today we're very excited to have a special guest with us. We have Anna Wilson, who completed her PhD in Medieval Studies in 2015 at the University of Toronto, and she's now an assistant professor of English at Harvard University, and she works on medieval reading communities fan fiction, critical theory, historiography, and the history of reading. And next year, she's heading to hang out with Suzanne at the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton for a year to finish her first book, which is about fans, reading, immaturity, and medieval literature. I'm so excited to finally read it when it's done. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. It's a very good podcast. (laughs) We're really happy to have you here. So we've brought you on to talk about Bear, even though you are not a specialist in Canadian literature necessarily, but I know that you love this book and we're excited to talk about it from your perspective. Can you tell us when did you first encounter Bear and what did you make of it? Well, so yes, I do love Bear. I'm I'm obsessed with this book and I think I talked your ear off about it for about six months after I read it. Um, <laughs> I, so when did I read it? I read it, uh, so I'd been in Toronto for a couple of years. So uh, as you can probably hear, um, I'm originally from the UK. Um, I moved to Toronto in, I, I don't know what, 2008 to do a master's and then stayed on for the PhD. And I think I I picked up Bear in a secondhand bookshop and I saw the, the, the cover, that classic 70s cover with the bear and the woman sort of in front of the bear with this sort of expression of ecstasy on her face. And it's so arty and it's such a great like painted 70s paperback cover. And I just, I said, I have to, I, I must have it. You know, I didn't even care what was in the book. I just, I had to, I had to have it. And I didn't know at the time, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know that it was a Canadian classic. And I I just, I read it and I just was completely smitten with it. Um, and then continued to think about it for many, many years. And as you said, I'm, I'm by no means a, a specialist in Canadian literature. And it, it did sort of fit accidentally into my project at the time, which was trying to read some classic Canadian literature. I must say I didn't get very far with that because to be honest, I just don't read much literary fiction. Um, it isn't really, it isn't really my thing as a genre, like Obviously, it contains many genres, but generally speaking, this kind of literature doesn't do anything for me. And one of the things I really love about Bear is that it actually turned out to intersect with a lot of books that I was reading at the time, which was feminist fantasy, YA feminist fantasy, um, which is thinking about animals um, in these very, very interesting ways and femininity that was written kind of a bit later, mostly like kind of through the, 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 from the late seventies through to the early nineties and beyond. But I was reading a lot of that. And I really think about that in relation to that. It's interesting because it strikes on two points that we, you know, Chris and I were thinking about a lot. That is the seventies feminism framework for understanding that book, to, for understanding Bear. And then also the extent to which we could understand this being a way of using animal natures to think about other kinds of things. Um, and so it sounds like that YA corpus that you were talking about was also engaged in thinking about identity through the animal and human. Yeah. And specifically female sexuality, I think. I mean, and, and you know, I, I'm trying to I- evolve my ways of talking about this in a way that isn't essentialist. But when I say, it's, you know, the way that they are thinking about female, quote unquote, female sexuality, is in this very essentialist kind of that you know that they're, they're, they're trying to think through ways to do it which are breaking away from patriarchal norms and they're experimenting with all different kinds of things and some of it is sort of experimenting with kind of mother goddess stuff and some of it is is deeply rooted in the idea of the cis woman's body but then again you know with these sort of normalizing frameworks that often um, end up being very white centric Um, you know there are real limitations to what they what they are imagining a woman to be but they're also trying to figure that out as they go and that I find that the 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 YA fantasy stuff interesting because it is it's both trying to figure itself out kind of on a intellectual history standpoint, but also through the bodies and minds of adolescent girls, right? So it's 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 like the micro and the macro of trying to figure out what it means to be a woman. Oh boy, there's so many things I want to talk about about this. Um, but I think maybe first, just to get a little bit more grounded, can you give us some examples of this YA literature that you're talking about? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking particularly of like, so Robin McKinley, um, Mercedes Lackey, Marion Zimmer Bradley, Tamora Pierce, you know, I mean, Marion Zimmer Bradley, I, I hesitate to mention because um, a whole bunch of horrible stuff came out later about um, the uh, abusive relationships that her and her husband were both involved in. But she was a very influential writer, though. But she was incredibly influential. I mean, really sort of mentored and created a whole generation of writers, of whom Mercedes Lackey is one. Uh, I mean, Mercedes Lackey is a YA fantasy writer who's just been churning, like, just churning books out, you know, for better or worse <laughs> since the late eighties. Um, and she is very, very horsey, you know, like girls and horses. Um, that's a big thing, so to speak, big, big thing. Telepathic horses are her thing. Um, and I find her books fascinating because she goes just to the edge of literal romance between teenagers and animals. Um, and she never quite goes all the way. You know, she always pulls back in some way. I mean, she wrote one novel where a the, the boy protagonist, quite unusual that she has a male protagonist, um, is explicitly in a romantic relationship with his horse, but the only, his magic horse, who's not really a horse, it's very complicated, <laughs> um, but the only way that she manages to contain that within the narrative and make it allowable is that this is within the um, within the frame that he is doomed to die. So we we sort of know that this cannot be realised or consummated, which which is what makes it okay for her to write it. Robin McKinley has written a whole series of very, very interesting and sometimes very troubling fantasy novels about sexuality and animals. Deer Skin um, is one that she wrote, which begins with a rape, incest, abusive situation, and the girl escapes and then goes through this sort of transformational experience with animals and ends up sort of but we're in this kind of relationship with a number of of magic dogs, if I remember correctly. And, and there's a sort of animal transformation, sort of mythic thing going on. And McKinley is currently halfway through a two book series of which the first is called Pegasus, which is an absolutely incredible first novel about a young woman who is telepathically bonded to a Pegasus um, as part of her people's uh, relationship with another, with the, with the other community of sentient creatures who share their planet, who are intelligent pegasi, and they have this sort of ritualized bonding between the scions of the various royal family. But she and this pegasus have a very unusual level of communication, and she goes to the pegasus land and ends up with this sort of body dysmorphia where she begins to see herself as a pegasus. And it's just wild, um, but I don't think McKinley's going to finish them. I, she became very ill, I think. And um, I'll just be devastated if she doesn't finish those books. It, it sounds like in a lot of these fantasy books that the thing that the fantasy aspect allows is for maybe not quite anthropomorphizing the animals, but giving the characters more access to the interiority of the animals in some ways, you know, the psychic connections. I assume, or maybe wrongly, but I assume conversations are happening between the humans and the animal characters. The sort of thing which you absolutely don't see in Bear. Yeah, well, you know, it was interesting when I was I was listening to your um your your discussion about it. And one of the things that I find so interesting about Bear is I think I had maybe a quite different reading of it from you guys, um, in terms of the role that the bear is playing in the book, because I see Bear as a story about a woman who gets the chance to do to someone else, which has always been done to her, right? And it's it, it's thinking through the, 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 the role of, I suppose, the sort of traditional role of the woman in this particular um, narrative of romance, which is that the woman is unknowable, the woman has these whims, she's, you know, she's, she's bonded to nature, she, she's continually idealized and projected upon and not allowed to really have an interior life. And she sort of breaks out of her experience of uh, heterosexual relationships by having this exploitative relationship with the bear. And I'm not sure that she, I see her as a very naive protagonist. You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure that she understands, you know, I'm not really sure that she does break three of those structures. I think she just replicates them upon the bear and comes away not really having learned a ton. 
Yeah, no, I would agree with that part, certainly, that uh, I don't feel like she's had quite as strong an epiphany as she thinks she has. Right. And and so the the, the book is, is constantly in, in tension between, you know, is this a, is she actually able to or trying to understand the bear as an animal versus if she, is she using the bear as a kind of mirror or as a kind of, you know, a way to think about herself or a kind of narcissistic sort of projection space and is enjoying using the bear and is enjoying, is appreciating the ability of the bear to be that for her. Yeah, that's a really compelling reading, I have to say. That is not that is not quite how I read it, but I totally see where you're coming from. Well, one of the things that's really striking, and, and, and I really like this idea that she's replicating with the bear some of the structures that she's been forced to live within in terms of gender dynamics. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. At the same time, she's explicitly comparing the bear with a man over and over again, but also with a dog. And then at one point, um, she, she thinks about him as a cross between a king and a woodchuck. So on one level in her mind, the bear is very strongly gendered male. Right. I mean, it's actually a male bear, but but also like it represents at certain moments like that that gender in some way. Um, but that doesn't preclude her reproducing the dynamic that she's experienced, but this time with the bear in chains. That's true. But she also thinks of the bear as a woman a number of times. I mean, the last image we have of the bear is the bear of an old as an old woman, sort of hunched in the boat um, with Joe. Yes, right. That's like, true. and and. I mean, you, you guys also didn't get to talk about very much about Colonel Jocelyn Carey, right? Who is the the other Colonel who kind of comes into view as the book goes on, and who actually we get to know much better than the original Colonel Carey. And I picked out a, a passage to 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 read, which was the one that that really, and I'd, I'd sort of forgotten about her actually. And rereading it, I was really struck by her. Can I read that passage? Sure, please do. Yeah, please. This is the bit where Homer suddenly becomes very um, sort of prolix and starts telling them all about Jocelyn Carey. Um, Was she a tall woman, Colonel Carey? Not tall, not short. Some taller than you, not much. She walked English style as if she was riding a horse. She was the first woman to wear pants up here. Would have created a scandal if anybody had time for one. There were those who said she was a snob and those in the family didn't get on with her. When they came to visit, she gave them a lot of things, china, silver. She said she'd no use for finery. All she wanted was her island. Now, she liked the odd beer, too. Used to sit on the dock with me there after the flies had gone, and we'd knock off a six-pack. She was a great gardener and a great fisherman. She had big hands like a man, way bigger than mine, and she didn't fool around with any lotions. Kept her house spick and span and all the silver polish that she hadn't given away. Baked bread did all those things women are supposed to do, and she kept herself a trap line. And he goes on and talks about how she she sold furs, right? Like she was a fur trapper, as well as doing this kind of homemaking. And he tells the story about her catching a lynx. And, And Lou is so thrown by this. And there's this line, which I was really mystified by on this reading. I'd be interested to know what you think of it. It says, she felt herself falling over with a little thud. Then remember that the colonel was not Lady Caroline Lamb, but a tough, bony old woman hooping the pelt of an illegal lynx to a willow wand. She was a great lady, she faltered. Nah, said Homer, scratching his head. She wasn't a great lady. She was an imitation man, but a damned good one. Mm, yes. <laughs> this chapter is one of the ones where I had like a million question marks on the margins. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? So so just for listeners, this is the final Colonel Carey. This is the one who gives the estate to the Institute. And Colonel is her name. Like, the rule is that the property goes to the next Colonel Carey. The previous Colonel Carey only had a daughter, so they named her Colonel to allow it to happen. And so there's this very strange name thing. But then, as you say, Homer, when meeting Colonel Carey, reads her as not a proper woman, but as an imitation man. And it's, I mean, I'm curious what else you're pulling out of that, but I think it's its super interesting. Yeah, I mean, my, I don't know if, if, if you guys sort of got this from the novel, but my reading of it was always that Colonel Jocelyn Carey was also having sex with the bear, right? Yeah. Well, she had two, she, she had two bears, right? This bear, she didn't care for that much, right? But she had a previous bear. Right. Right. And that one she, and that one she loved. Yeah, but the bear still knows his way into the house, right? And sort of seems to be accustomed to being intimate with humans, right? Like I don't know, I I always got the impression that she I mean this isn't really explored in the book, but there's a kind of interesting like 
queer relationality there, I guess, where, it, I mean, it's like she's using the previous Colonel Kerry's dildo. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, mm. there's a sort of, yeah, yeah. there's a kind of communality and intimacy with Colonel Jocelyn as well as with the bear. And the bear is kind of triangulated between the two of them in this sort of indeterminate kind of gender space. It isn't explicitly stated, but I had always assumed that the original Colonel had also been having some sort of, like, clearly had a deep relationship or a deep fascination with the bear. Right. Like, there's a genealogy of bears here. Like, there's a whole history of bears here, right? Right. And Byron. Yeah. And well, and of course, and yeah, and, and the reference to Byron, who who had a pet bear and who had sex with everything. <laughs> um, so you <laughs> right. can put two of you together there, I suppose. <laughs> but yeah, and there's a sense in which, yes, there is a genealogy of bears, but there's also a sense of there has always been a bear, right? There's the bear that's associated with this house and this island. One of the things I was really struck by in this passage is that there's the two bears. I had a lot of exclamation points in this part. Um, so the bear that's there now is one that um, Colonel Jocelyn had. Homer doesn't know exactly where it came from. Maybe Lucy gave it to her. Um, but I always felt sorry for it, he says, because Lucy and Joe were the only ones who paid any mind to it. The colonel just sort of tolerated it. The one she was fond of was her Irish setter. Now, the other bear she had before, he was a character, followed her around the house like a dog. And that was a really sad passage, right? That's the thing that makes her almost fall over is the death of that first bear. Yeah. I mean, the bears are weird, right? Because they're kind of, they're mysterious in how they reproduce, right? Like in a way there is always, that there's there's only the one bear, right? And it's always been the same bear, you know, for the last 150 years. But also they are distinct bears who have different relationships with the humans who care for them. And I mean, I, I, that's, that difficulty about what you do with the bear, I think is one of the reasons I keep coming back to this book. I wondered if that's like, one of the ways I think this book is sometimes read is as using the bear or bears or, you know, this, this, this perennial bear thing um, as a way of talking about, you know, quote unquote Indians, right? Like understanding the the role of indigenous peoples, right? Who show up in this book in different kinds of ways. They're mentioned at the periphery in different places in connection with Lucy Leroy and Joe King. But there's something else that's always there as long as the settler colonial thing is going on. Yeah. And I mean, I think you could also read the bear as being the, the land, right? And the Canadian wilderness. And again, like, I think that the book is very explicitly pairing her sexual exploitation of the bear with the colonial exploitation of the land and the desire to, the sort of romantic desire to occupy and kind of make love to the land and ultimately not reckoning with the land as it is. What do you think of Lucy Leroy in this, the indigenous woman who attends to the bear and who there is a, a, a really interesting dialogue at the end that we mentioned in our episode about how, I mean, it, it almost sounds like she was setting Lou and the bear up on the, a date or something, right? Like, the, you know, oh, you'll get along with this. You're, you, you're a woman who needs to, to know this bear. Yeah, I mean we just don't get to learn that much about her, right? And I mean, I think that's one of the, maybe one of the limitations of the book. Um, and I'd be curious to know, you know, especially what you think of this, Suzanne, but I, I really, I feel like the book doesn't think of Lucy and Joe as real characters, right? Like they, it, it, you know, because Lucy potentially is also part of this network of women who've been using the bear sexually, but we don't get to, we don't get to learn more about her relationship to the bear. She, she just facilitates Lou's relationship with the bear. And I wish that there was more interiority for her there. And I don't, I, I sort of, I feel like the book kind of resists interpretation there just because there is no there there for me about like this is this is very much for me a book about white settler colonial experiences in the Canadian North. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I wondered if part of the opacity in the depiction of Lucy is not unrelated to the opacity of the bear. Right. So there's this one encounter at the end of chapter seven, where Lucy Leroy is described and she has this encounter with Lou, right? And she's described as an old Indian woman and so on. And um, she was totally withered. Lou imagined the body under the old pinned clothes, imagined its creases and weatherings, the old thin dugs. I will be like that, she thought. But the woman's eyes were alive as oysters. And so there's something in a book that doesn't spend a lot of time talking about youth and age, there's something strange going on there in terms of the points of connection, right? But the, the other thing that's really striking here is it's clear she has some understanding of the bear, right? She she says, good bear, good lady, take care of bear. 
And Lou's like, I don't know how to take care of him. And Lucy's live eyes crinkled. Good bear. Bear's your friend. I was a young girl once. I came from Swift Current. Married a man came here. Now I live on Nebish. He's a good bear. Right. Um, and then she tells Lou how to make friends with the bear. Right. So there's like, it's, it's, how can I put it? It's not the same kind of opacity as you get with the bear, but it's almost like, I don't know, flickering. You know, I'll be like that someday, this point of identification with Lucy. There's this, you know, Lucy understands the bear and she understands Lou. I guess that's what I'm noticing there. And, and I agree with you. It's not a fully realized character, but the function is to sort of, I guess, mediate between the unknowable world of the animal. And this other world. Yeah. I don't know. She doesn't take, well, I I don't know if this is an idea that's going to go anywhere, but she she doesn't, the author does and doesn't take the route of following the, the kind of um, racist cliche of the First Nations people being a sort of mystical conduit into knowledge of the bear, right? There's, there's, there's a little bit of that, but, but that, the, the opacity remains. And, you know, even though they do take the bear away at the end, they're also still participating in this kind of complicated, you know, human animal network relationship in a way that doesn't seem massively different from Colonel Jocelyn and from Lou. It's like they're all working within, to some extent, within the the, the settler colonial system that's that's emerged, right? That is Canada, right? At this point, yeah, maybe, or maybe that they're just. The, the another way of relating to the bear is outside of the imaginative landscape of this book. I mean, an, another book that I that I have been thinking about a lot in relation to this, especially on rereading, is a book called Mother Lines, um, which is by Susie McKee Charnas from 1978, which is a a, a, a radical um, lesbian separatist science fiction novel about a society of previously enslaved women who have escaped and formed a separatist society. And it's a separatist society which is very obviously um, and sort of appropriatively based on some indigenous American communities, I mean, in a sort of vague kind of borrowing way. And it's a nomadic culture which is in a sort of um, very close relationship with horses. And they have utilize some kind of science fiction technology so that the women literally have sex with the horses under very ritualized and controlled circumstances and thereby have more human children. Um, and I can't remember what they do with the boys, but they keep the girls. Or maybe they've controlled it so that they only have girls. And it, it's actually really strongly contrasted to this book because the, the horses in that are very, very explicitly animals. They have a very complicated symbolic relationship and they're sort of almost revered, but they're also not romantic or sexual partners in any way. They are tools who are valued and who are used for a number of purposes, one of which is reproduction. So they're like livestock as opposed to pets. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And 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 some of the women, you know, f- form very close relationships with their horses, but they also have no hesitation in putting down the horses when they cease to be functional as, t- as tools. Yeah, that, that makes me think about something that Chris and I are wondering about quite a bit, like the extent to which we understand Bear in the context of 70s feminism. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. And the extent to which we read that book, you know, f- which came out 45 years ago, I say, well, what is it saying to us now? Like, what does it have to offer to the conversations we're happening now about animal and human and gender and and a whole range of kinds of issues? And, so, and one of the things I... I felt was that on the one hand, it's a book, it's very much of its moment, like in terms of Canadian national identity, in terms of a certain kind of feminism, all that stuff, right? But it's also, it's not that, it, how can I put it, it's not of this and that it's of this moment, but it, I feel like it has things to say or things that are worth thinking about in this moment. And I wonder if some of that is true of mother lines as well. In other words, if those are participating in a particular moment of thinking about gender and sexuality that is useful to be thinking back at now. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I I mean, what I've been thinking about it in relation to is the moment that we're in of trying to figure out what we do about children's sexuality and the debates that are happening, um, particularly in the UK, around um, controlling treatment of trans children and, um, and in the US as well. I mean, you know, just have these rulings about trans children in sports and policing gender in sports that are, that are built around... Um, delaying um, any kind of intervention to support trans children. And the reason that I think about it in relation to those YA books is that, um, and, and here I'm thinking a lot 
with a um, a theory book which made a big impression on me, which is called um, The Queer Child Growing Sideways in the 20th Century, which is by Catherine von Stockton. And her argument is that books where um, young adolescents, mostly girls, I think, in her book, who, who f- where they form strong relationships with animals, those books are about children thinking through alternatives to heteronormativity, basically. They're they're about children experimenting with different kinds of romantic and erotic bonds, which can happen outside of the scripts which are given to them as being available to them in human society. And I wonder if Bear is, you know, Bear obviously isn't about adolescence, but it but it is very it, it does read to me as a coming of age story in some ways, right? And I and I think, you know, Bear is participating in that, in in trying to think of alternatives to how we think about what kinds of sexual contacts um, and romantic relationships are possible. But I think it's a book that ultimately ends in the failure of its experiment, which I think is in some ways more interesting. No, I totally, I think that that uh, fits very well with what we're saying before that like the, that Lou imagines she's achieved an epiphany way more than we have a sense of her having, I, I mean, I was really struck by the language of cleanliness and, and filth here, right? Like in other words, she becomes aware of being dirty at a certain point and for her. That's a kind of a separation from this whole experimental environment she's been in, this, this grand experiment she's been in the midst of, right? I mean, I'm thinking about the you know the way that the novel thinks about time right and the time that she's up at the institute is sort of outside of her the routines of her life but also is uh maybe offering a permanent break in them or maybe not I mean you know she intends to go back to the city and 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 end her job but you know is she actually going to do that and I I really I love the way that the little sort of details about her life. You know, we get to know her as the book goes on and we start to learn a bit about the, the the details of her life. And one of the little details that is dropped is that the director fucks her across the desk every week, you know, and, you, and you're just kind of like, oh, sorry, hang on. like <laughs> <laughs> That was not clear in any of the interactions with the director at the beginning of the book. No, no, like, oh, this is also part of your job, right? Like, I, at the same time as reading this, I'm reading um, Audrey Lord's book, Zami, Another Spelling of My Name, um, which is, I think, 82 or 83. And it's not like this book in any way, shape or form. But um, one of the things that really struck me about both of them is that they both have this ubiquitous background noise of the threat of sexual assault which is something that I, I I was sort of slightly shocked by reading both of them because it's been a long time since I've read anything by women from that time. And, and, and I mean, it, th- that is, um, you know, the, the reality still for many people, but, but it's been a long time since I've been kind of exposed to that moment. And I think, I mean, especially if we're thinking about coming out of 70s feminism, I think we've got to think about Bear in relation to that and, and in relation to trying to work out what sexuality would look like outside of violence. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, there's a sense in which these are books that are participating in thinking about what would it mean for women to be uh, not just like sort of strong and independent in some abstract kind of way, but specifically in the environment of sexuality. Like what, what, would, what would that look like? And in what spaces does that become possible? Yeah. And, and in what community can women be with each other um, outside of violent sexual relationships between women and men? And in the book, her relationship with Lucy and with Babs, Homer's wife, and with the previous Colonel Carey, um, I think are all sort of interesting in that respect. Yeah. I, I remember being really struck by this one little tiny little detail in her encounter with Lucy that we were talking about earlier. I, I just, I don't know, it just seemed like an important moment. So Lucy holds out her hand to Lou. It, it, it says repeatedly, holding out a withered hand, then a little bit more. Then she held out her hand. New lady, she said, new lady, good bear, good bear. I didn't hear your boat. Lucy grinned unnervingly, still holding onto her hand. Good bear, she said, good lady, take care of bear. And then it goes on. And it's just strange. So it's new lady, good bear. And then it's good bear, good lady. And in the middle of that is this scene where she's not letting go of her hand. And I remember reading it the first time being like, like, it's a weird moment. Like it's, it's, I can't think of another moment other than when the bear attacks Lou, where Lou is kind of constrained. Yeah. And also the the detail of, of Lou, like arriving on the island without her having heard the boat, it kind of makes me think of the mystery of where the bear came from, right? There's this sort of moment where 
Lucy is kind of being aligned with the bear, maybe in a in a problematic way, but they're both sort of unknowable in some way. Yeah, there's this like a little later. She did not look 100 years old, only eternal. <laughs> right. Yeah, right? like the bear. I mean, you know, which is like this cliche, right? But but it is. I, I think that the scene, the, it, I guess one of the reasons the scene is so unla- uncanny is it lines up Lucy with Lou, you know, I will look like that one day, but also with the bear. And so she's like already a meeting, like there's already a kind of meeting ground of Lou and the bear, but it's it's through, it's in Lucy. One of the things that was in my mind when you were talking earlier, Anna, about the YA fiction that provides such an interesting context for thinking about bear, uh, I'm like, you were t- you were talking about horses in that literature, and you know that's almost a cliche, right? You know, like young girls and their love of horses, right? And it made me think about like why why a bear? Like on the one hand, this book is about animal and human natures is one of the things it's about, but but it's also a bearishness very specifically. And and the book kind of encourages us to think that through at a couple of different moments. One of the ways is when um, she describes the bear as being sort of quasi-human, like so in that scene where the bear is going away in the boat, like a sort of a hunched over old lady, and then at other moments um, being compared to um, like like a, a cross between a king and a woodchuck. Right. So there, there's the sort of quasi human moments, but there's also a very, very, I don't know, I think very beautiful moment at the, in the, in the last lines of the book where she sees the stars, right? She drives south and she sees the stars. And, and this is, the stars been evoked at different moments in the book here, various sort of important moments. And here it says, it was a brilliant night, all star shine, and overhead the great bear and his 37,000 virgins kept her company. So it's referring to the constellation, right? Um, Ursa Major, which is the female bear that has the little bear, Ursa Minor, right? And and so it's evoking the bear, but it's also evoking a feminized figure. And it's also an allusion to something earlier in the book that mentioned Ursula and the 11,000 virgins, right? So there's like this strange kind of, I don't know what to call it, like cobweb of interrelation of male bear, female bear, mythic, different kinds of mythic bear. And I just wonder what to make of that, because it's clear that the stars are representing some kind of apotheosis, but they're also doing something strange in terms of gender. Like, it's still within the gender binary. There's no third term here. But it's not within the hierarchy that we've been getting as the norm through so much of the book. So I, don't, I, don't, I wonder what you made of that. I found that part both beautiful and um, difficult. I don't know. I mean, I think it's to do with histories of domestication, right? I mean, the horse is a fundamentally different proposition because the horse has been so domesticated and has been bred to, you know, towards greater understanding and intimacy and sympathy between human and horse. And the bear is still wild and is unknowable. And and I think like, again, like it, it can stand in for the landscape, right? Like Northern Ontario being wild and unknowable, but also sort of partially domesticated in the process of colonialization if you want to i mean as i and i'm ventriloquizing what i think the novel is saying there rather than um the that would not be the way i would describe it myself um so i don't know that's my reading of why a bear i mean if we're thinking like why a bear as opposed to a horse for example i don't know what do you think chris I mean, I certainly agree that a horse is far too tame for what this book is going for, or far too domesticated, rather, for what this book is going for, uh, because it is about that encounter with the uncivilized or the less civilized moments, right? It's, it's about going into that heterotopic space where you're far away from work, so to speak, although your work is there, but you're defining it in that sense. You're far away from the city, you're far away from other people, eventually, like you're getting further and further away from everything else into this space of possibility. And a horse, yeah, a horse isn't nearly as alien, but familiar. It's not in that sort of weird zone. I think she describes early on about how it's a real bear and it's not a teddy bear, right? It's not It's not like the kinds of bears that her domesticated imagination has. It is something that she has to confront as wild or potentially wild, even though it's not as wild perhaps as, as most bears you might meet in the, in the North would be. Yeah. And there's also an element of class fantasy, right? I mean, you guys talked a little bit about this, that she kind of unwittingly enters into this chain of sort of eccentric aristocrats who just kept bears for, you know, just for whatever. But it's also not an animal that you can do work with, right? And there's a lot of stuff about the rhythms of her work and how playing with the bear kind of interrupts the rhythm of her work and she sort of delays and and draws it out and stuff because she's so distracted by playing with the bear. I mean, the bear kind of represents luxury and ease in a weird way for her, I think, in a, in a way that 
you know, her, like her garden fails, right? Like her general commitment to work just just collapses, and and she 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 idly thinks about staying there for the winter and thinks about all the work that she would have to do, you know, and she thinks about putting up preserves and she doesn't do it. And, you know, there's this backdrop of the grinding amounts of work that you have to do to survive in that landscape and, and her just kind of opting out of that, but like taking her jollies from it, I suppose. I don't know. It's a very strange, it's a very strange thing. And and she doesn't have to take responsibility for the bear because it's not a horse or a dog. Hmm. I, I'm also curious now in in the other young adult and you know uh, human and animal interaction books that you've been thinking about in the context of bear. I mean, horses come up a lot, it seems, but do other animals come up? Like, like is it a broader spectrum of domesticated and wild animals in these books, or is it mostly the more familiar things? That's an interesting question. Um, mostly domesticated, I would say. A lot of horses, a lot of cats, a lot of dogs, some uh, parrots, but I mean. The complicated thing there is that a lot of times the animals are sentient, right? And they are in some way not actually animals, you know, the, the and they, they kind of occupy that animal human um, space in a, in a slightly different way. So often the books are leaning on the space that those animals can pass as, if you like, like they can pass as domestic animals and they can do some of the same roles that those domestic creatures would do, like if they were really those animals. So like, you know, that they can ride on the horse, they can ride them into battle and the dogs, you know, can accompany them and hunt with them. But they're also romantic and, and spiritual companions and mentors and stuff. There's also also a lot of mythical creatures a lot of pegasi, but I'm thinking about it. I mean, you don't really, I think, see a ton of wolves and stuff like that. But where you do see wolves is in the massively popular um, rise of shifter erotic romances. So wild animals are really big in erotic romance right now. Um, a lot of lot of were leopards, werewolves, were pumas. You know, the, the the wilder and more dangerous, the better. I think. So in all in all of this literature, right, it's mostly all kind of, I mean, if not completely, but it's like mostly all fantasy literature, right? Which makes Bear stand out for me in sort of sharper relief. Like, it's not fantasy. Like, it's very purposely not fantasy. Like, it's very real what's going on here. And I and and I find myself wondering about that. Like, for a book that sort of presents itself as so fable-like in certain kinds of ways, like, what's the effect of this insistent landscape and materiality? Well, is it not fantasy though? Well, I don't know. You know, because, like, like I don't know. Bear, I don't know. Bears don't domesticate like this, really. I don't think. Is my understanding? I have no idea. I mean, I'm mostly basing this on having seen Grizzly Man, but <laughs> 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 but my sense is that bears aren't really tameable in the way that this book presents. And there is a, there is definitely some sort of mythic elements about the nature of the bear that's been attached to the house. Like there are some hints of, uh, if not fantasy. I mean, not quite magical realism, but something like that is looming around the edges, I think. Well, you, you know where I get that is, you know, the shed that the bear lives in was the original house that the original colonel lived in. Oh, yeah. Isn't that creepy and magic realist, right? Oh, my God. Is Do you think the bear is the original colonel? Did he just turn into a bear and he's always been there? Well, that's what I thought at first. You know, Well, you know what I mean? Like, when I first started reading, I was like, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, I was like really freaked out. But, but um, so so there is something almost sort of magic realist at the oh, edges definitely. there. I think that's yeah. true. But, but I guess when I say it, we feel super real, it's not because I think, you know, you could domesticate a bear like that, right? But I guess because I, when I was reading this, and maybe this is one of the things I found really unsettling about the book, is like, like you know, I've I love I've loved animals, right? I had like really close relationship with animals, and and I and I love that, but I also find it like hard to understand. Do you know what I mean? Like I remember as a child having a really intimate relationship with one of our cats. Like I really love that cat, Clyde. He was a manx. He was very beautiful. And I remember as a little kid one time. And my parents were like, oh, my father was like teasing me. My parents were very young. My dad was teasing me. He's like, oh, do you think we love you more or Clyde more? And I said, well, I guess you probably love us both the same. Because I had heard once somebody say, you know, you should love, you know, you could say you loved your parents both the same. But I didn't say it to be cute. I was like, I actually, be I understood this to be true. You know what I mean? And so like, and on the one hand, like, I, so that's what I mean by realism. In other words, like those relationships with animals are real. 
you know, but I don't know how to talk about them. You know, this is interesting. I mean, it's it's getting to me. So I am someone who does not have relationships with animals and mostly because of various like structural constraints, like growing up, uh, my, my parents, we traveled a lot. It wasn't really a, a home which was very conducive to pets. Both I and my mother are quite allergic to cats. Um, both of my brothers now have cats. And I, I, I like and enjoy animals very much and think I could have a very close relationship with animals. I had two hamsters consecutively when I was a teenager and just absolutely lavished like love on them, like, like dreamed about them for years after they died. And they were hamsters, you know, there's nothing to hamsters. I mean, they're just, you know, balls of fur and nerves. And, and now I, my wife um, believes that keeping animals inside is imprisonment um, and, uh, and, and just isn't like pro keeping pets at all, which I find sort of charming and fascinating and don't necessarily agree with, but it, but, you know, our lifestyle also, you know, we, we are a transnational couple and, and it's not convenient for us to have animals. Um, and we now have a baby. So, you know, this, this, we're not going to be getting any animals anytime soon, but I don't know, like, so in, in a way it's sort of an exotic world to me, the world of having the opportunity to build a really intimate long-term relationship with a thinking creature who is not a human. So, which is, I mean, that was a massive tangent. I mean, I think that there's some interesting genre stuff going on with this book. And I find it really frustrating that this book is not really, to my knowledge, thought about or talked about in relation to things like The Left Hand of Darkness, for example, or, or Mother Lines, you know, or um, or YA fantasy, you know, because it won the Governor General's Award and it was championed by Robertson Davies. You know, it's part of this kind of Canadian canon in a way that like funnels attention to thinking about certain aspects of the book over others. And I think that it makes it seem frivolous to think about the fact that she has sex with the bear and that she thinks that she loves the bear and what that means in relation to like stories about girls and unicorns, right? But why why shouldn't we take those seriously together and think about those as a concerted effort to think about women's sexuality and animals and the way that animals have been part of the literature of women's sexuality? Well, we've we've talked about a bunch of things. Is there anything else about Bear that you wanted to talk about? Well, I wanted to hear about what you guys think about what the book is doing with Englishness. Because you know, I'm English. Um, all three of us have lived in Canada for longer or shorter periods of time. I think both of you at this point have lived in Canada for much longer than I did. Uh, but 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 none of us w- was born in Canada. And reading it this time particularly, but I think it did strike me the first time I read it, Bear is doing something with what it means to go to Northern Ontario and study England. And and I think, it, you know, there's that great line where she says, you know, you don't go to Northern Ontario to study 19th century London, or do you, or whatever that, that exactly that line is. And, and, and I don't know, it just, it struck me, I remembered somebody saying to me when I shortly after I'd gone to graduate school to study medieval literature in Canada, uh, what, you know, why have you gone to Toronto to do that? And I was, and I said something like, oh, well, you know, I'm just reading the text, you can do that anywhere. But, but I think that was facetious. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about why I was able to to, you know, to, to look differently at medieval England from Canada than I would have been if I'd stayed in England. And the long, long, long process, which I'm still not finished with, of reckoning with what it means to be British and Britain's colonial legacy and and what it means to be English specifically out of Britishness and how I move through the world in North America as someone who is very audibly British as soon as I open my mouth and the ways that people respond to that. And I don't know, I think I think Bear has kind of helped me think about that a little bit. Yeah. No, I I I think that is a really interesting thing to think about. You know, there's on the one hand, this book sort of presents itself as being and is read as being, you know, Canadian literature, right? But it's a very particular kind of Canadian literature. It's literature of English Canada, right? Even though there are references to other kinds of people and Francophonia and so on, it's really about Northern Ontario and English Canada. And you see this in a whole bunch of different ways. One way is through the Carey family genealogy, where there's the family, you know, they come from England and, you know, the wife doesn't go any further than Toronto. Like that's absolutely her her limit, you know, in the colonies, like going up north is not a possibility. Um, so there's that sense that you get further and further away from 
like the center of empire, right? As you get more and more rural and more and more, you know, remote. But there's also like her, um, her earliest encounters with the library include this really neat moment where she's looking at a volume of engravings of ruins. Did you guys notice that? It's, it says a volume of engravings, of ruins, Piranesi. She stared at the broken columns for a long time. Then she went and looked out the back window, brushing a dead fly off the empty counter. The bear was staring up at her. And says so when she's first getting to know the library, she is a summary of the contents. Uh, she wondered where else there was such a perfect library for its period, right? So she's beginning her work. And and so that look, so Piranesi is someone who does engravings of ancient Rome. So it's about the decay of empire, right? So I thought that was like, I mean, it was a little heavy handed, but I thought, well, that's that that's a way though to like help us understand the library. The, the library is a ruin. Mm, mm. Yeah, there's nothing else about this book, but it's heavy handed. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but you know what I mean? Like, but I mean, that's what the Piranesi volume is for, I think, to tell you what the library is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I also, I really enjoyed the kind of her gradual sort of disillusionment with the library in some ways. Like initially, she's really charmed by the fact that it is this perfect 19th century library. But then ultimately, she ends up being really frustrated and she's unable to get a sense of who Colonel Carey is. And she keeps the bare notes separate from the rest of the archival sort of investigations. And I don't know, there's... I, there's this sort of sense of like emptiness and nothingness to it. Do you know what I mean? Like she, she, she goes to Northern Ontario and tries to, is trying to learn something about early settlerhood and maybe about herself. And she ends up having sex with a bear and finding nothing (laughs) or finding something that she could have found anywhere. Right. Like there's this, it's like the, Oh, you know, you go to a city and it just looks like anywhere because of corporate, high street stuff. You know, I, I, it's it's like the the colonial has come in and has made this house like any other house in the British Empire. And that is a terrible loss. But the bear is somehow separate from that, but also has been made into nothing. I don't know. I think I'm not being very articulate here, but there's, there's, there's a critique of colonialism somewhere in there, I think. Yeah, that the, co- the colony is the same everywhere in some sense, right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, it's part of that complete disenchantment with like, uh, I, I, like if you put it this way, Western epistemology that kind of happens in this book, right? Like there's this neat moment right after Homer has told her this incredible story, right? And and like her mind is blown by it. And then she's she's thinking about that conversation. And she asks herself, what was the use of all these cards and details and orderings? In the beginning, they had seemed beautiful, capable of making an order of their own, capable of being in the end filed and sorted so that she could find a structure, plumb a secret. But now she felt there would never, ever be anything as revealing and vivid as Homer's story. They were a heresy against the real truth. Yeah. And I think there's this there's this tension between the the neatness and sort of um completeness and sameness of the library and the fact of the you know the, the stories that she begins to hear about the realities of the people are these gender and sexual outlaws to an extent, right? Like the original Colonel Carey leaves his wife and is obsessed with bears and Jocelyn Carey is an imitation man and is is coded as, as a lesbian in the way that, that that's the sort of, you know, whether, I don't know whether the book intends us to read her that way, but that's certainly sort of one of the ways that literature codes gayness in women, right? But she she doesn't find a way to reconcile those two different sets of knowledge to actually come away with what she intended to get, which is stories about the original set, like the early settler life there. Yeah, there's no way to tell that story. No, because it's all oral and anecdotal and in impressions. And in the the bear, who is a, you know, a living conduit between her and Carrie, but all she has is the information that the bear knows how to move around the house. Yeah. I mean, you talked about how this book resonated with your personal journey. Did you walk away feeling like you had learned anything about, so to speak, England? <laughs> from the book? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, to an extent. I mean, it was funny because reading it, I was thinking, oh gosh, I really miss Canada. But it wasn't because the book reminded me of, like, it isn't because I get, I feel like I've got any knowledge of Canada from the book, because I think the, the book is partly about this, like, romantic idea of Canada and is is trying to kind of figure that out and that way. but 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 I missed Canada because I remembered being there when I read it and figuring out what it meant for me to be in Canada was kind of part of you know the book was part of that journey 
But whether I learned anything about Britishness, yeah, I think so. I, I think it's there's something about like you know seeing one's own place in that Western epistemology and in that library and in the replicating of a particular English literary archive in North America and what it means to do that. And I think I'm only kind of at the beginning of figuring that out. I mean, I think you can absolutely read this book while thinking, why am I teaching Chaucer here? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Should I be having sex with a bear instead? Or is that better than teaching Chaucer? Are they the same thing? Would that improve my pedagogy? <laughs> Would that improve my pedagogy? You know, is this like an evolving part of my practice? <laughs> How do I incorporate shift a romance into teaching Chaucer? You know, these these are all the, the big questions. <laughs> um, amazing. Anna, thank you so much for coming and talking about this book with us and, yeah, and bringing you. it into so many new and interesting perspectives that we didn't have access to. It's been really a treat. Oh, thanks for having me on. I, I really enjoyed talking with you guys. Listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd always love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 46B. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at the Spouter Inn.